Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for another edition of the podcast. It's great to have you along. I hope you're all well and managing to spend just a little time at least out on the water. It's beginning to get a little bit chilly on this side of the globe, but wherever you are, I hope you're still managing to get some sailing in. As ever, many thanks for all your feedback and your comments on the last podcast. Lots of you got in touch about our interview with Grant Simmer. So thank you. It means a lot. It was great to have Grant on the pod with all that cup insight so close to things kicking off down in New Zealand. So if you like what you're hearing on the pods, do please give us a like, leave a comment and let all your friends know you've enjoyed it. It all helps here in podcast land. Also, a big thanks to everyone that got in touch last week. I had a very special anniversary, 20 years since winning my first Olympic gold medal down at the games in Sydney. It seems like a lifetime ago, but many thanks to everyone that sent their wishes. It means a lot. And I also got a lovely email this week from another podcast fan who got in touch to let me know that he'd bought an old boat of mine. Also great to hear. The Yingling, in fact, that we sailed to gold in Athens. So thanks for getting in touch with that news. It's lovely to hear she's still putting in the time on the water. While I was a young woman setting off on my early Olympic career, our next guest was taking on the world in a very different way. In the 1980s, she embarked on an unexpected career in offshore sailing, and by the end of the decade, was crossing the start line of the Whitbread Round the World race, with the race's first ever crew made up entirely of women. They were competitive, driven, and sparked a huge amount of interest as they sailed around the world. By the time they crossed the finish line, Tracy Edwards was a household name in the UK. Her story is an inspiration. But as inspiring, perhaps, is the way she tells it. Tracy wrote a great book after the finish of the race. I remember getting it for Christmas. She's recently told her story in a fantastic film released early last year. So I'm very aware of Tracy's achievements. But listening to her in this podcast, the way she tells her very unique story, you can still hear that fire. The passion and drive of the young, determined Tracy Edwards is still there. It's so inspiring to hear. Now, I mentioned the movie, Maiden, after the name of Tracy's boat. So we start off with a brief chat about the film, and then in part two, we leave Tracy for a few minutes to catch up with the film's director, Alex Holmes, from New Black Films. Alex very kindly talked to us about Tracy and how the film project came about. It's a great angle on the story. We also pick up on the rest of Tracy's career her Jules Verne record attempt, and the setting up of a round-the-world race in the Middle East that left her bankrupt and under virtual house arrest. She's honest, she's funny, and quite genuinely an absolute legend in the true sense of the word. I hope you enjoy the time I spent with Tracy Edwards. Gerard Butler's upstairs. He's seen the film, he absolutely loves it, and he can't wait to meet you. He said, no, no, you can't. Women don't do the whip bread around the world race. And I went, what? I wanted to navigate, and I knew that no man would ever let me navigate on his boat. Well, thanks for joining us, Tracy, and welcome to our podcast. It's so good to have you on. Have you discovered the, the joy, the magic of podcasts yet? Are you a podcast listener? I am actually a podcast listener and I didn't think I would ever say that. You know, I used to hear people waffle on about podcasts and I'd be like, oh, for goodness sake, they can't be that great. But of course they are. And uh, I, I absolutely love them. Good news. Good news. Uh, I won't ask you if you've been listening to ours. I have been listening oh, well, to ours. <laughs> so you know what you're in for. Yeah. <laughs> 
Tracy, whenever I've seen photos of you over the last couple of years, it's all been red carpets and Hollywood movie stars. It's not often our guests have a movie made about them either. I mean, that's probably been such a lot of fun. How's how's the whole thing been for you? Totally surreal. I mean, it, it last year, the difference between last year and this year could not be more extreme. I mean, I feel so lucky that we didn't release it this year, the film, because, you know, I feel so sorry for the films that are being released this year. But of course, last year was, um, it was just full on. And actually, we first saw the film in June 2018. Um, the uh, So they decided to get all the crew together to watch the first version, just to make sure that we were okay with it. And uh, so we all gathered at BAFTA with some friends and family and colleagues and associates. And we all watched it for the first time. And we were blown away. Absolutely. I don't think any of us could have imagined how what a great job Alex did with this film and our story, which you know, it was quite nerve wracking that someone else was telling our story. Um, But we we all feel, you know, that he got it totally right. It's real. It's raw. It it is our story. He hasn't mucked around with it. And, you know, I think the interviews he did with us, which everyone says they really love in in the film, were, were great because he didn't show us any of the footage, which had taken him two years to find this footage all over the world. Um, so it was all from memory, all of our, and he did say, actually, when he'd finished interviewing all of us, he said, I've never interviewed a group of people who have all such same memories about something that happened so long ago. So uh, we must have got it right. <laughs> well, we're going to, Tracy, we're actually going to speak to Alex later in the podcast, just to, to get his take on it. And we are going to talk a little bit more about it. But what's, what's the general reaction been to it? Oh, absolutely overwhelming. Uh, I had no idea that it was going to have the uh, uh, impact that it's had. So it's a 90 minute, so it's feature length. And of course, being shown on the big screen, uh, the uh, the sailing, the ocean shots are, and the noise. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And, you know, touring America, my daughter and I toured America on the film tour for, for two months, literally a city every three days, you know, screenings, interviews, um, just nonstop. And um, it premiered in in uh, at the Tribeca Film Festival, and by then it was ninety eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes, which I'd never heard of before, but it was just hugely important to to filmmakers. And after the screening, I went to the after party, which again is a whole new level of craziness. And uh, I, I arrived after everyone else, and um, the guy that welcomed me, he said. Gerard Butler's upstairs. He's seen the film. He absolutely loves it. And he can't wait to meet you. So I laughed. And he went, no, I'm serious. Gerard Butler is upstairs and can't wait to meet you. I went, okay. (laughs) Um, And then Whoopi Goldberg was, of course, our guest of honour at the New York screening where all the crew were invited. And that was wonderful, running rampaging through New York with the original Maiden crew. Very dangerous. Uh, She's now one of our voices, which is uh, fantastic. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, who I met in L.A. when we had the screening there, also one of our voices. So, I mean, it's just it's not just done a great deal, I think, for sailing and for women. Um, but I think it's also really helped the, you know, the, the maiden project we're working on now. So um, it's just been fantastic. What a crazy time. I'm imagining you're rampaging through New York. Uh, we'll talk about the movie a little bit later, Tracy. But all this week, I've been reading my rather yellowed copy of your maiden book, written from your diary straight after the 8990 Whitbread race. I even found a picture of my old boyfriend from the 90s lodged between the pages <laughs> used as a bookmark. I could remember his name, though. I could remember his name. I mean, my takeaway from the book now and thinking back also back then was that you were a really determined woman who had the tenacity and the belief to make to make stuff happen. You know, and I'm curious to know where that stubbornness came from how did the, your early life shape that fierce determination that was to follow describe for me the young Tracy Edwards 
I think my mother could probably have put it the best. Um, you, I, you, you're too young to remember this, but there used to be an advert on television which ended with a little girl saying, and my mummy says, I'm going to be a proper little madam. And that was my mum's description of me. Um, the first 10 years of my life were idyllic um, with, you know, very middle class upbringing with a wonderful mother and a wonderful father and a wonderful brother and, you know, very normal, very happy very, um, you know, full of adventure and dreams. And, you know, my parents always encouraged this in my brother and I, the adventure and dream and, you know, the, this, this sort of freedom uh, of thought. And um, I think that even then at that time, I showed that I had, there was a stroppiness to me, uh, which um, I think my mother tried to find endearing, but uh, I, I very strong minded, very strong willed and very much my own person. Uh, it, but when my father died, uh, when I was 10, uh, my life changed uh, very drastically. And my mother married my stepfather, who was um, not a particularly nice man. And we he moved us down to Wales, which was actually a great thing because the adventure continued, you know, mountains and oceans and wild and living on a, you know, derelict farm. And that was all that was all amazing. But the um, I guess the, the stroppiness part of me really then came to the fore. And, you know, I became a very angry, very aggressive probably quite nasty teenager. I mean, I spent my teenage years, Tracy, hanging out at the sailing club. Yours was a little different. Growing up in rural Wales, it's well documented that at the age of 15, you were expelled from school, a proper tear away. And quite quickly after that, went backpacking alone in Greece. I mean, that was pretty progressive back then. Looking back on it all, how crazy does all that seem? Well, when my daughter reached 16, I remember thinking, there is no way I would let her, you know, go off on her own. I mean, I think the world was a safer place then, or it seemed safer because we didn't have rolling news and the, the bad stuff coming at us all the time. So, you know, even though I guess it was the, the 70s, it was a time of optimism, not in the UK, but for anyone sort of going out into the world. And my mother, my mother knew I needed to go. I I, oh, I kind of don't even want to think about where I would be if I hadn't um, today. And, you know, so getting the magic bus down to Greece um, on the hippie trail uh, and then backpacking around Greece and then ending up working in a bar, um, you know, all at the age of 16, which is, as I say, seems pretty crazy now. But it, it if that hadn't happened, I I just, I can't imagine what my life would have been like. And, you know, at the age of 17, to be offered a job on a boat, which then became the thing I would do for the rest of my life. I mean, how lucky is that? You know, no, no qualifications, no exams, typical 17 year old, oh, I don't know what I want to do. Um, you know, and then my world that I was supposed to live in, just landed in my lap. It was amazing. How did you end up on a boat, Tracy? I mean, it must have been quite a brave captain to take you on. <laughs> he was. Mike Corns changed my life. Uh, he came into the bar one night and uh, we were chatting. He said, I've lost my stewardess and we've got a charter coming up, you know, in a few days time. And I'd seen these, you know, beautiful yachts in the harbour. And I'd met, you know, some of the crew who I knew worked on them, but I never imagined, you know, that I would be able to do anything, you know, as amazing as that. And uh, he said to me, and then he looked at me and he went, as if seeing me for the first time, he said, you don't fancy being a stewardess on, on, a, on a yacht, do you? And I went, uh, OK. I <laughs> didn't particularly like where I was working. And literally the next day I was on the boat and we left to go to Rhodes to pick up our first charter. But I also have to say... Um, that the cook, um, Janie Carini, she was also very instrumental in changing my life because it was her that did the interview and said, yeah, I like this girl. I want this girl. No experience, no anything to recommend me to, you know, a life at sea or being a stewardess. But they said afterwards they saw something in me that they liked. And um, I, I've been lucky enough to have that theme through pretty much every boat I've ever worked on where I've had the skipper and the cook often 
who've been mentors of mine. So that was the start of it. And I mean, I they must have been wondering, though, when I was seasick for four days going to Rhodes, um, whether they'd made the right choice. I mean, seasick doesn't come into it. I thought the best description of seasickness is, first of all, you're afraid you're going to die, and then you're afraid you're not going to die. And that was a perfect description. When we got to Rhodes, it was touch or go, touch or go whether I was going to actually stay on the boat. But everything else overrode that, you know, and for me, it wasn't um, wasn't necessarily the ocean or the wildlife or the sea or even the boat. For me, it was the people. And I realised that I had found my tribe, you know, the, these are the people I'd spent up until then looking for. And they made me feel included. And I mean, we were all, we were a really mixed bag, you know, we were uh, you know, just reprobates and gypsies and travellers and nomads. And we just gravitated towards each other. And for me, that lasted, you know, for the whole of my, uh, you know, sort of time sailing. It, it's the people. What do you think they saw in you, Tracy? I think they saw that wildness that they had in themselves. And I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I tend to make friends easily. Although up until that point, you know, I probably spent most of my life feeling on the outside looking in. I, I didn't, I didn't ever really get stuff that other people got really quickly. And I would always feel slightly behind everyone else. And this is the first time I felt as if I was in the right place at the right time with the right people. And it was, it was that overwhelming, the, the change in my life. And I guess I changed and I blossomed and I, you know, came out of myself. I know people find that hard to believe that I was ever uh, sort of an introverted in any way, but I was given the confidence to, um, to have an opinion, speak my piece, to, to engage and also to overcome my, my biggest, deepest fear is embarrassing myself. That is my, it's worse than any other fear I've ever had in my life. And I finally got over that, you know, learning to do things, learning to sail, learning to navigate, learning to do all these things, which took a massive amount of willpower from me to come out of my safe space, which was, I can't do anything. I can't do anything. I'm, I'm here in my little, you know, shell. Uh, so maybe they saw that transformation in me and and I did throw myself into the sailing life in every single way possible like you still do now I mean so quickly Tracy you moved from motorboats to sailing yachts I mean what grabbed you about that what did you make of it all oh for me I mean I I, I couldn't understand when I was because I started on a motor yacht this sort of rivalry, you know, and when we would come into port, all the sailing guys would like, you know, snarl at us and we'd snarl back. And I was like, what is all that about? And then, of course, you realise that, you know, most of yachts, pollution and, you know, so various other things, and maybe not now, but then, you know, at that very sort of basic stage of things. And then I got onto my first sailing yacht and it was like, wow, you know, no throbbing engine, no smell of diesel, oil, just this... Oh, just this freedom and and I loved as well um watching everyone doing all these intricate it's like an intricate dance you know these maneuvers and and I would watch someone knowing that that person was going to do that and then that would happen and I, I, this was fascinating for me and again a first sailing yacht um I, I, well the Indian Ocean was my first sailing yacht but I've blanked that from my mind it was a horrendous experience my first enjoyable um trip on a on a on a yacht properly was a transatlantic and and that was my first transatlantic and that for me then was the a huge turning point in my life and realizing that I could actually learn this stuff I mean I I'm not I'm not an instinctive sailor I'm not a natural sailor I I've never sailed dinghies and I think that's so important for you know sailing big boats but I learned and again I had these great teachers I had this amazing skipper uh, the, you know, these these mentors and my second transatlantic, you know, my skipper looked at me, there were four of us on a on a Swan 45 going from Antigua over to do New Lag in the south of France. And he looked at me and he said, can you navigate? And I went, <laughs> of course, I can't navigate. I was expelled before long division. It's stupid. And he, he said to me, what happens if I fall over the side? And I said, well, there's two other guys on the boat. He said, what happens if they fall over the side? I'm like, oh, for goodness sake. And he said, looked at me and he said, 
why are you being a bystander in your own life? He said, you're supposed to play the starring role in your own life, not a bit part. I'm like, okay, that's a little bit profound for two days out into the Atlantic. But he said, I will teach you to navigate. He said, anyone can navigate. It's, you know, it's just numbers. To me, numbers are hieroglyphics. I was like, oh, I don't think I can do this. Again, didn't want to embarrass myself. In two days, he taught me to navigate. And again, it changed my life because I fell in love with navigation. For me, that's my passion. That's uh, that's the thing I would do above anything else. And I, you know, he he literally said to me, take us to Villamora in Portugal. And I went, um, but you'll be watching. He went, no, we're going to end up wherever you take us. It's like, oh, okay. We got there and that sense of, I did this, I, I did this, I, I, we're sailing into this harbour because of me. And I've never lost that. And um, so all the way through the different processes and parts of sailing, you know, I have been guided by these extraordinary people. There's a long way from that to the Whitbread. I mean, how did you, how did you first hear about the Whitbread Round the World race? Well, much like you with your book and the picture, um, I was sitting on a boyfriend's boat in Antigua and he had a book on his bookshelf and it was called Cape Horn to Port. It was a bit dog-eared and raggedy and I thought, oh, this looks interesting. And I opened it up and the first thing I looked at was a picture of Julian standing next to the broken mast of Condor and I went, this is you. This is what? He was always very quiet. Never he said anything he'd done. He said, oh, yeah, that's the Whitbread Round the World race. And it's fantastic. It's absolutely the best thing I've ever done in my life. And I love it. And I said, oh, do you think maybe I should go? And because I just got into racing and I was beginning to realise how much I enjoyed it. Not serious, but, you know, weekend stuff. And I said, maybe I should give this a go. He said, no, no, you can't. They, they don't. Uh, women don't do the Whitbread Round the World race. And I went, What? He said, no, they, they don't allow women. Not really. There, there's been a couple, but, you know, that, that's it. I wouldn't bother. <laughs> we, and we didn't last very long, funnily enough. Um, but uh, literally two weeks later, a Whitbread boat sailed into Falmouth Harbour. I kid you not. And the skipper came uh, uh, across and I went to speak to him. And I said, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, a ride on the Whitbread around the world race. And it was actually... Um, uh, a cook's job on a, it was kind of like a charter boat. It was called North Data. Um, it, it ended up being a horrendous experience, the first leg. And this doesn't really come through in the documentary because it was too complicated to say that I'd done the Whitbread on two different uh, yachts. But um, I did the first leg on this boat, North Data, and it was horrendous. It was an amateur crew who were paying to do the race. And I, when you... Um, at my level of experience, when you realise you're one of two, the two most experienced per- people on the boat, you're like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> this cannot be a good thing. And when we got to Cape Town, I thought, I, we're going to die on this boat and I, I don't want to do the whip red that much. So I got off the boat and that's when I got onto Atlantic Privateer, which was the boat with the biggest bunch of reprobates in the 1985-86 Whitbread that you could ever imagine. I mean, they were all friends of mine. I knew them from, you know, partying in Hamble. But knowing guys on land and sailing with them, the two totally different things. They did not want me on the boat. You know, they were like, why are we going to be the only ocean racing maxi with a girl on the boat? And um, I actually, I remember now, I went behind the skipper's back and I went to the owner, Pada Cattell, and I said, Pada, I'm here, I'm a cook, I'm here, I've got the menus, I budget, you've got to take me. He said, what does Shag say? So Shag was the skipper and I I said, "Um, Shag doesn't want me on the boat. He went, right, let's take you, this should be fun. So I I think I was a little bit of an experiment and maybe some entertainment. (laughs) There's a good lesson there, isn't there? You know, never take no for an answer. Absolutely. There's always a way. Absolutely. There's always a way. I love that about you, Tracy. I mean, it was the mid 80s, it was the 85, 86 race. Equality, opportunities for women. I mean, this wasn't really in anyone's mindset back then. How did things look for women in that race? Oh, dire. Um, it was like this. It was like the best kept secret in the world. You know, it was like the ultimate man shed at the bottom of the garden. You shall not go there if you are a woman. 
And I remember, you know, I think there were 260 crew. I mean, this, these, the fleets were huge in those days, you know, 23 yachts, 260 crew. Four of us were girls. And one of those dropped out in Cape Town completely. So there were three of us left. And I was the only one on a maxi. And we were all cooks, obviously. Uh, there is no way that a woman could have been on any of those boats, even the cruising boats as crew. And that was the, my first, um, I didn't, really know about sexism on charter yachts because we were all in the right place you know the men were on deck and the girls were in the kitchen or stewardessing and that never occurred to me you know because we were like nuclear families mummy and daddy and and the two children it was very freudian uh so i'd never experienced that you can't do something when we went racing at the weekends we all did everything and that's how i learned so to suddenly experience this was it was really eye opening and shocking and knowing that these guys are my friends on shore, but when we get out at sea, think I'm an idiot. I'm not strong enough. I'm not, um, I'm not able enough. Uh, I, rem- I remember the first storm that we went through. Um, Paul Stanbridge, um, who's a great mate of mine, I started coming out of the hatch. He put his boot on the top of my head and pushed me back down and closed the hatch. He said, there's no place for girls up on deck right now. I'm like, What? Okay, but after the first leg, which we won coming into New Zealand, we beat uh, NZ Enterprise by uh, seven minutes, which was the t- uh, shortest amount of time at that point. I mean, now it's closer. We literally match raced them down the coast of New Zealand, which we were to do a few years later. And um, so then I became the lucky charm. And that was fine. Then I was okay. Um, you know, they started out by making my life a misery, but in the end, these guys taught me everything I needed to know to do a whip bread, and I couldn't have had better teachers. Uh, they were such a great, such a great, talented, diverse crew. And when we were coming in on the last leg, I remember saying to them, "Well, what do you, what do you think about an all female crew doing the whip bread round the world race?" I think there'd been an attempt in the back of my mind before, and I mean, my reasoning wasn't feminism or you know girl power or anything like that I wanted to navigate and I knew that no man would ever let me navigate on his boat it just would it's not going to happen so it was really a selfish reason I wanted to put an all-female crew together so I could navigate (laughs) Um, and it, it was Stanbridge who said to me if anyone could do it I reckon I reckon you could give it a good go so I was like okay and then I told my mum and she was like uh, <laughs> she said, I don't want to put a damper on this, said, but you've never stuck at anything in your life. She said, and while that's okay, if it's just you, if you do this, you're going to, you're going to hold 12 people's dreams in your hands. And if you suddenly go, no, I don't want to do this, like you do usually do, that's not going to be good. So you've got to be a hundred percent, absolutely clear that you want to do this. And so the next person I spoke to, I flew over to Jordan and uh, to see King Hussein, who I'd met whilst chartering and we were, uh, we'd sort of become friends, stayed with him and his family in Amman and said to him, this is what I want to do. And he went, you must, this is your destiny. This, he said, everyone's born to do something and this, this is your destiny. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) And I, you know, sort of came home and I thought, I can do this. I I mean, it makes me laugh now when I look back that all the, you know, I remember someone saying to me, oh, um, Ted Turner was heard walking down the dock in Newport saying, who's this silly little cow that's putting this all female crew into the Whitbread Round the World race? And I went, oh my God, Ted Turner said that about me. And she went, yeah. And I went, Ted Turner knows who I am. And she went, is that what you got from that? I was like, yes. <laughs> so it was this juxtaposition of all the big big guns in the sailing world going a stewardess and an all-female crew are you kidding me and my um belief which was i can do this i'm going to be the navigator i'm going to find a skipper and it's all going to be fine and it makes me laugh when i look back at that so much I mean, the reality of it is it's a, a massive project you know not just crew and boat but obviously finding the the budget and the backing to make it all happen. I mean, what are your memories of those early days getting the whole maiden project off the ground? Well, I guess the race was really just 
changing from amateur to professional and I I wanted very much to be a professional ocean racing team. I'd learnt from the best. You know, I wasn't walking into this cold. Everyone saw me as a charter stewardess, but I one one of very few women who'd ever done the whip ride. So I was very clear. I'd learnt, you know, management, um, budgeting, fundraising. I'd learnt all of these things. And so I mean I had to to carry on teaching myself, but you're right. I mean, the project was huge and we wanted it to be of a sta- of a level, of a standing. We didn't want to just be a bunch of girls sailing around the world. We wanted to be a professional ocean racing crew who had every intention of winning. And the detail that went into this, um, when I look back at it now, is quite astonishing. We were so clear in our minds about how we wanted to present ourselves, how we wanted to look, what the feel of the project was going to be like, what our messaging was going to be. Initially, of course, that messaging was drowned out with the laughter and the, um, you know, Bob Fisher, God bless him, and his um, maiden's just a tin full of tarts, one of my favourite quotes ever. And uh, you know, female journalists writing things like um, women will never be as good as men. Back to the kitchen sink, girls, you failed. I mean, just in main, in you know, in, in mainstream press. And but I don't I think we didn't really I mean, we, we took notice of it. I mean, we, we used it. Um, it made us angry. So we it galvanized us. And uh, and I think as well that, you know, every article just lit that fire under us just a little bit more. I my mum said often said to me, she said, I wonder what you would have been like if everyone had said, Oh, that's a good idea. Off you go. I wonder if you'd have just gone, no, I'll go and do something else. You know, that it was this this aggression against us doing it. And it wasn't just, you know, people saying to us, you're going to die, which a lot of people did, although I that was our business, not theirs, but anyway, it was this anger and it took me a long time to realise that, you know, this wasn't just that people didn't think girls could do it. They didn't want girls to do it because they wanted this to be their race and they didn't want, you know, it was their last bastion, you know, they crossed the start line and phew, no women. Um, so it, it was a battle. It was a huge battle. It got quite nasty sometimes, but we were hugely supportive of each other. And, you know, right from the beginning, Maiden attracted these extraordinary people. You know, Howard, meeting Howard Gibbons in the pub, he was a yachting journalist at the time. And uh, he said, well, I'll be your project manager. I went, okay. And, uh, you know, then literally just kind of making things up as we went along. And then, uh, you know, the next person would join. And so then we had a crew house I couldn't pay anyone, you know, so we would take someone on as a trial crew member. And we'd, the first thing we'd say to them was, you have to go and get a job because I can't pay you. I can give you somewhere to live and somewhere to, something to eat. Uh, so we all had two or three jobs. And then we had this great <laughs> team of people in Hamble selling balloons, boxer shorts and badges at boat shows to raise funds. Little bits and pieces of sponsorship. And then it really was um, a lot of this the way we changed and became the professional team that we were was with the help of Admiral Charles Williams, um, who literally said to us that he'd had complaints from some people saying that women shouldn't be allowed to enter the whip bread. And uh, he'd said, that's absolute rubbish. They, they will enter. And he was a force to be reckoned with and very instrumental in helping with media and interviews and, and stuff like that. And, and so it went. And, you know, we, I guess it would have continued like that with us not being able to find the money if we hadn't bought the boat. And that's what changed everything. And it changed a lot of attitudes as well. Although Andrew Priest, he hates me telling the story, uh, did write in Yachts and Yachting, Tracy Edwards says she's going to buy a boat. We'll believe that when we see it park- parked on her front lawn. <laughs> so, you know, it was never easy. But getting the boat made people go, oh, they might be serious. Well, I know Andrew listens to the podcast, so he's definitely going to hear that, <laughs> Tracy. I wanted a team of feisty women, not a bunch of sheep. Tracy was not a comfortable person to be around at times. This is not just a tin full of tarts. This is a tin full of smart, fast tarts. Very few women had ocean racing experience. 
you know, how did you go about assembling a team? Why did they believe you? I think, well, I, I know all of all of the crew on Maiden were looking for something. They were looking for something like this. Now, they all had their own reasons for joining, but I didn't have to go out and search for a crew. They came to us. I mean, I think we had over 400 letters in the end and news spread like wildfire. And just at the point where I was going, how am I going to find a crew? They just arrived. And um, we knew it probably couldn't be an entirely British crew because there weren't the women with the experience. I was the only one that had done the whip bread. And um, I knew there were great women out there, but, you know, not necessarily immediately in my sort of near geography. Although Sally, of course, from Scotland, Joe from uh, Wales and Angela from Ireland and me from England. So we had to have our, you know, UK uh, representatives. Actually, it was King Hussein who said to me, when you're picking a team, always make sure you're the most stupid person in the room. And I thought, don't I be? Don't I want to be the smartest person in the room? He said, "No, no." He said, "You want to look around you and know that every single person has more experience than you, is better than you, smarter than you." I'm like, "Oh, okay, I I see." You know, and it was, that was like a, a a eureka moment. I thought, "Oh, I'm sure that's going to be fairly easy, actually." Uh, so then I'm looking for an electrician and a, a sailmaker. So these letters are coming in and I'm going, oh, look, Tanya Visser from, from uh, Holland. Uh, she's, a, she's a sailmaker. Oh, she's a dentist as well. I'm not sure I like that. But anyway, it might be useful. Um, the only person we actually actively went out and looked for was Claire Russell, our doctor. Um, a lot of the boats didn't think it was important to have a doctor on the boat. Uh, knowing what we'd been through, I thought we've got to have a, I want a doctor. So we found a doctor who was kind of a bit of a sailor and then we, you know, sort of taught her to sail basically. And so this team kind of generically came together and a lot of the people who were there at the end were the people who survived it. I mean, survived the looking for money, the, you know, sometimes no food. Um, Sorry, girls, you're going to have to go and get a job uh, and then we'll reconvene. Uh, when we eventually, I sold, uh, well, remortgaged my house to buy a secondhand boat, which uh, was the old um, Distor 3, who was in the 82 Whitbread. Uh, she'd ended up being sailed around the world by Bertie Reed as Prestige. We, we knew we couldn't. We knew we couldn't build and design and build our own boat like these shiny Maxes that we were seeing arriving in Hamble. So we found this old boat, literally persuaded someone to stick her on the top of a ship and bring her back to the UK. And I remember we kind of got a maybe three quarters of the team by this point. These are the stalwarts. These are the ones that are going to stay till the end. And the ship comes in and Jenny looks up and sees what would become Maiden. And she goes, is it behind that one? And I went, no, it is that one. She went, holy hell. <laughs> and that was the moment almost where I knew I had the right team because there was a lot of sleeve rolling up, determined looks and right, let's sort this boat out. And I thought, oh my God, look at my, look at my amazing team. And then we all learn stuff, you know, so I learned more about putting a nav station in that I ever wanted to know. And uh, Jenny wired the boat and, you know, she was apprenticed to the electricians and Claire did the plumbing. We all had something. We had two or three jobs. And then, of course, you know, extraordinary uh, sailors like uh, Mary Claude, who, although she didn't do the whip bread with us, was, you know, I could never, I could never have put the project together that I put together without Mary Claude. She was the absolute backbone. And it is, it's such a shame that I didn't deal with our personality clash until it was too late, which is totally my fault. Absolutely not hers. Um but what she did do was she taught me a lot about, you know, the kind of people I was looking for. And you mentioned, obviously, the disagreement with Mary Claude, and it's in, it's in the movie as well. It's, you're kind of left wondering, you know, what happened. But I guess more generically, I want to know what kind of leader you were. What was the dynamic, if you like, in the, you know, in the tribe? I think it's a shame that... They didn't put in the film what happened because, of course, Mary Claude ended up doing the next Whitbread on Heineken with Dawn and Jenny, which was much better. We then rekindled our friendship, became great friends. She's actually now looking after Maiden in Hamble. 
so and did the film tour with us as well. So I, I do want to add that, you know, that she's always in her heart and our hearts. She's always a maiden. Uh, the dynamics uh, were interesting. Uh, I think when Marie Claude was there, because we had a quite a male uh, hierarchical structure, which was the only way we knew to build a team because we'd only ever been in men's teams. What Marie Claude leaving did was it relaxed the structure. Um, you know, I found uh, another watch captain. So we ended up with, you know, the, the navigator kind of skipper because I took on the skipper's role then and the two watch captains. But the two watch captains were the most crucial part of that team because you know I was so fixated on my on my navigation yes I would make the final decision you know I had to the buck stops with me but you know without that um that that we we turned into a female structure and we didn't know we were doing that it's only in later life I looked back and went oh right yeah no that that's you know, because women don't work well in male hierarchies, I, I don't think. And I, I think in modern day, the whole hierarchy thing has changed in business and sport and in every other walk of life. But at the time, it was very much like that. And um, we were learning all the time. Uh, as a leader, I... Oh, oh, that's a hard one, really, because I didn't see myself as a leader. I saw myself as a project manager and a navigator who was going to have a skipper. And gradually we realised that that's not going to happen. Um, when Mary Claude left, it was, that was it. So suddenly the dy whole dynamic changed. And I think that I know one thing that people don't believe when we say it, although we keep saying it, is we never had an argument. From when we crossed the start line to when we finished, we did not argue ever. We had heated debates about, um, you know, which sails to have up, as any team does, you know, but... I wanted a team of feisty women, not a bunch of sheep, you know. So um, the whole thing was a massive learning process and I had to learn how to be a leader. Or as I say, I find that word quite, I don't see myself as that. You know, I kind of, I was the maestro, you know, I just kind of put the whole thing together. And I realised actually after the race and probably after, no, after the next two projects, my skill is in putting great teams together. That That's my skill. I, I, I find great people. All my teams have been absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and that's because I find them. Now, how we manage that, I think, in Maiden was more luck than judgment. And I think a massive amount of patience on, on you know, the, the, from my team who, I mean, I was... You know, Claire says it very well in the film, although she's very diplomatic about it. She says... Tracy was not a comfortable person to be around at times. I thought, blimey, I thought you would be much sort of stronger than that because it was, it was so hard. I mean, it's really actually hard to get across how um, traumatic some of it was. And, you know, if we hadn't had each other, you know, we, we wouldn't have made it. And our male shore crew, we have male shore crew. I mean, it's, it's never easy not not even now to raise money you know you need a quite a big degree of luck and uh, but how why do you think it was so difficult and then just just maybe tell us you know what happened at the 11th hour that made it all possible well I think what was so difficult was I think I mean we had we wrote to hundreds of uh, companies and you know were introduced via various people to companies I think people recognised that it was a great PR idea and that, you know, they'd get a lot of out, out of it. But the fear really was, you know, if we died, that, that they would be blamed for it, you know, and it wouldn't it wouldn't be great PR. Um, and it was that real understanding of just how much people didn't think we could do this. And it that would drift away every so often and we'd, you know, be down on the boat or we'd be out sailing and we'd feel you know, we know we can do this. And, and, and then, of course, the cold you know, the bucket of water over your head was when you got a letter back saying my favourite one, which was the thought of 12 of my wife sailing around the world fills me with horror. And I just thought, oh, my God, this is what we're up against. So ew, it was hard. Um, and in the end, uh, we, we owed, um, you know, qu quite a, we had a we had a very understanding bank manager who's <laughs> probably in a straitjacket by now. But 
he um, he invited Howard and I in one day. Now I'd spoken to uh, King Hussein about oh, you know we're having, I didn't want to ask him. I th- it seems such an obviously awful thing to do for me to ask him, you know, for sponsorship or help or money. Um, but I, I told him that we were really struggling. I didn't think we were going to get to the start line. And uh, when Howard and I went into the bank to beg, you know, to, to have our overdraft extended and to, you know, sort of have a chat with uh, Des Holmes. Oh, I just remembered his name. Um he said to he said to Howard, so you must be really pleased, you know, that the, the sponsorships come in and Howard went, Absolutely. Yes, yes, we are. And and um, and how much exactly came in? And he told us and we were like, yeah, that's that's absolutely great. So I went home, picked up the phone, King called call King saying, so just thank you so much. He said, well, it's sponsorship, Royal Jordanian Airlines. We want to promote Jordan. We want to promote peace, gender equality. I thought, wow, what a wonderful message. And of course, that's why Maiden is her beautiful grey you know, that iconic grey colour with the red and the gold stripe, which is the same colour as the aeroplanes. What a great story. What's a great story. Um, Tracy, you know, we often cover the big round-the-world races, and I always get a feeling with some sailors that they've had such a tough time actually making it happen. I mean, the reality of actually sailing around the planet often hits them pretty hard as start day looms. What was it like for you and now actually having to race, lead a team, you know, having the responsibility of it all, having to make race decisions? What was that like, you know, as we got to the start? A relief. Um, Anything to do with sailing the boat was a relief because that's what we were meant to be doing. Um, And you'll know this as well as anyone of course, when you cross the start line of any race, it's for everyone else, it's the beginning. And for you, it's the end of so much hard work <laughs> to get you there, the training, the, you know, everything you have to do. So the build up, I think, was quite tense. Um, I mean, we had no, uh, you know, no doubt at all that we could do it. I was, I guess, well, we just, you know, Mary Claude had left literally two, three weeks before the start. And, you know, half my crew had looked at me and said, we don't think you can do this without Mary Claude and we want to get off. And so I I'd literally had to beg half my team to stay. And I said, look, if you, if you still think I can't do it when we get to Uruguay, I'll fly you home. And no, you know, no questions. So they stayed, but it was a, it was a, it was not the start we were expecting. You know, Joe had broken a wrist. She wasn't there. Um, yeah, Kristen's lovely and great stand in, but it all felt a bit disjointed. So, you know, massive build up to the start, which I mean, even, you know, even Peter Blake gets nervous for the start of a race, he told me. So, this tension and this build up, and yes, you've been looking at charts and you've been, you know, planning your route and everything else. The relief of crossing the start line was. I can't actually describe it. It, I mean, it was just the culmination of of so much, and 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 then we looked forwards at the horizon and we thought, this is the bit we can do. We can do this bit, you know. And it had been such a such a battle to get there, and then to settle into that, um, to settle into that uh, watch system, and which which you know we did like that. We were. You know, it, it was like we'd been at sea for a week already, you know, and as the last sort of spectator boat leaves, land disappears, and then suddenly you're in this, oh, wonderful universe where no one else exists. Um, obviously, the other boats exist, but, it, you know, it, it's, um, that's the bit, that's what you do it for. And, and that's when you think, oh, thank God, we, you know, we, we got to this bit, because this bit, you know, this is the great bit. You did well, didn't you? I mean, better than anyone expected. I think you were third in the first leg. You won two of the other ones. Were you conscious of attitudes changing towards you once you'd shown, you know, you were a contender? Yeah, so when when we sailed into Uruguay at the end of the first leg in third place and we were gutted and we were we were distraught <laughs> and everyone else was just, you're alive, oh, you're 
you you survived, you know. So we had this really weird party on the dock, you know, with these really depressed women from the boat and these really excited everyone else, you know. It's very, um, as I say, surreal. And when we started on the, the Southern Ocean leg, we were, I mean, we were so fixated on what we knew we could do and so confident. And it really knocks my socks off, actually, to look back on that time and to realise just how together we were. And I don't really remember that. Again, the film reminded me. I mean, we look like, there's me going, there's all the other skippers going, oh, uh, yeah, no, we're not going very far south, you know, because the ice is very far north. And there's me going, oh, well, I'm going really far south. I'm going the further south that we can go. And, you know, it's just like, oh, my goodness, it's it's so weird. But we did. Uh, we did go further, further south, of, south of any boat. We took a, a couple of really big risks and it paid off and we won coming into Australia. And yes, you could feel, I mean, we knew we could do it, but people around us. And I think the maxi guys were interesting because, of course, in our class, we, we were three classes mixed together, the smaller boats. And um, of course, they hated the fact that we'd won. But the maxi guys were like, this is pretty cool, you know. I mean, they, they thought it was cool that we were beating the guys that they weren't racing against. So we got a lot of support from them. But we always did, you know, from Peter Blake and Skip Novak, as much as he says he poo-pooed it, he helped us. And um, so, yeah, attitudes started to change. When we won coming into New Zealand, that was like, um, it, oh, it just sealed the whole deal, really. And that was my favourite article by Bob Fisher. And I'm sad this wasn't in the documentary either, that he he changed his mind. He allowed us to change his mind. And he wrote his first article uh, when we got into New Zealand and said, I'm putting salt and pepper on my hat as we speak. This is not just a tin full of tarts. This is a tin full of smart, fast tarts. And I remember all, all of us on Maiden going, oh, this is a Bob Fisher, wow, until someone said to us, you do know the word tart is still in that sentence. And we were like, baby steps, baby steps. But no, people did. And I think, you know, there were a lot of people that were gutted then that we lost um, first place before we got back in Southampton. But, and I still have to say, it still, still um, drives me nuts that we didn't win. But we came second and, you know, I think we showed that women could be professional and skilled and survive and take it seriously. And, you know, all the things we wanted to prove, we did. Tracy, there's a story that I often tell and you can tell me if it's true or not. <laughs> I think it's a little bit of an urban, an urban myth, but... Something involving Grant Dalton about what he said, that if you won, if the women won a leg, he'd stick a pineapple up his bottom. Did that actually happen? He did actually say that and run naked through the main street of Auckland. Uh, did he do it? No, he did not. So, Grant Dalton, I mean, every time we see each other, we rib each other about that one. But no, it's, it's actually true. That's how confident he was that you wouldn't win the leg. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you say, Tracy, by the end of it all, you finished second overall. You led the first women's team to finish the race. But talk to us about that finish. What was that like, arriving back into Southampton, having done it? Describe the day for us. Oh, it was, it was just so extraordinary. Um, Howard, the little rotter, had told us that I'd be, as we'd been so long um, running, we ran out of wind and food, as we'd been so long finishing the final leg, everyone had gone home and there was no one there. Uh, so we were like, oh, right, OK. Oh, well, that's OK. Uh, you know, our, we knew our, our family will be coming out in a boat. It's, you know, it's fine. It's fine. And uh, so literally that weekend, we ghosted towards the finishing line. Oh, there was absolutely no wind. And we finished on bank holiday Monday, just totally by fluke. And, you know, so we we thought, well, you know, we'll see our friends and family and maybe go for a pint at the yacht club, something like that, you know. And of course, we're sailing sunrise. We see the needles, which is such a, well, you know, it's such a beautiful sight when you're, especially when you're coming home. And uh, and then we saw a boat um, and then another boat. And Nancy said, oh, I wonder if there's a regatta on today. 
and so then another boat but as they got to us they turned and started to come up alongside us so we're sort of looking at them and um, I remember Sally saying to uh, one boat are you, you going to follow us up the Solent then and the, the, the people on the boat were like yeah yeah and then more and more and more and they reckon there were 600 boats in the Solent uh, following us up I mean at some points it was a little bit nerve-wracking when we had to jibe because we were jibing our way up and you know you've got to go right you lot <laughs> move <laughs> uh, there was Cos Evans in her speedboat with her you know big lens um Che Blythe um Lord Moynihan all these um banners you know this this a boat full of journalists which was tipping over because they were all sort of leaning over towards us people throwing flowers at us uh I mean <laughs> Yeah, what's I remember at one point Sally saying to me, she said, do you think there's someone more important behind us? I went, I'm pretty sure this is for us, Sal. You know, so, yeah, no, it was, um, it, it almost took the sting out of not coming first, almost. And uh, then, of course, we came around the corner and they'd ordered a special cannon, which was so loud. And if you watch the film at the end, when the cannon goes off, we all jump because none of us are expecting this really loud noise and then as we finished every ship in the harbour blew its horns and every boat around us and there were claxtons and horns and it was <laughs> I was in absolute bits I'm nearly in bits now um, people come out of the cinema you know sort of with tears streaming down their faces and um, it was it was so special and people were so kind and so generous and you know just to take the time to come down their families, they were reckoned there were 50,000 people in Ocean Village, um, which, as Bob Fisher says, was one of the most spectacular finishes of all time, to the point where it took us two hours to walk from Maiden, literally along the pontoon, to the, to the Royal Southampton Yacht Club, because everyone wanted to shake hands and give us a flower, and it was just one of the best days of my life ever. It was big news. I mean, proper front page news. The tabloids, they loved it. And you, Tracy, were in demand. How crazy a time was all of that once you'd come back? Oh, it was, um, yeah, it was good and bad. We'd, we'd done an amazing job, which was fantastic. You know, all the press were with us. It was it was upbeat. It was positive. You know, we we felt we'd really made an impact for women's sailing, for women's sport. Um, you know, we won loads of awards. I won loads of sports awards. Um, first woman to win Yachtsman of the Year, MBE, the book, you know, the, the Whitbread film. I mean, it was, it was manic. But, um, and this is something I didn't talk about for a long time, but, I, you know, a lot of sportsmen and women at the moment are talking about mental health. And, you know, we are very aware that strong people um, you know, often don't ask for help. And what happened at the end of the race was I had to sell Maiden, which absolutely broke my heart. And then, of course, all the girls went off to do what they were going to do next. And I stayed. I mean, it was my choice. I stayed to, you know, keep the whole thing going and, and everything else. And in the end, I, I fell off. I fell off the edge of a cliff and I, it was um, it, it, drastic. And um, I got to the point where... Uh, jo had to drive up from Wales, um, took her four hours in her banger um, to come to Hamble. <clears throat> and when she came to pick me up to take me down to Wales for some, you know, chill out time. And this was in, I guess, November, December. So we'd finished in September and had just been sort of full on. Um, she found me locked in my walk in wardrobe with the phone still in my hands. And uh, she basically swept me up, packed some things and drove me down to Wales where I stayed for two years. And I I literally fell over. And it, it's not something I've spoken about, you know, for, for probably, well, the, the majority of the time after the race, but it's important now, you know, to, to join those voices who are saying, you know, we can't all be strong all the time. And my biggest lesson, um, chill out and ask for help. Um, that that was actually my biggest lesson from the whip. But people think it's going to be how to navigate or how to whatever. Nope, it's none of those things. It's if you need help, ask for it. It's always difficult, isn't it, after a project, even in the Olympic world. You know, you get post-Olympic depression, even if you even if you won. You know, it's really hard. 
But it, just thinking back to that time, I mean, it wasn't just sort of talk shows and visiting schools. I mean, you had the full attention of the tabloids. They wanted to know more from you than just sailing. They wanted to know about, you know, your personal life as well. I mean, how how hard was that? And I guess how unexpected? That was really tough because it, it, it was unexpected. And, you know, I think I was, although I'd done what I'd done, I was emotionally quite a young 27 year old and I tend to see good in everyone until you prove me wrong which is why you know I have fallen flat on my face a few times I trust people I do tend to do that uh, but uh, no I mean in the middle of that was the divorce um, from my uh, husband um, who we'd only been married about a month at that point got married at the end of the race and then literally two months later that was a, that was a bad decision and um, even though it was a very amicable uh, split uh, yeah they, people wanted to know more than we wanted to tell them and that was another reason I disappeared off down to Wales actually with the press in in pursuit and it was only when I sort of kept my head down probably for a couple of months that they they all went home and and uh, peace reigned in, in the small village in Wales which I then lived for the next two years but, you know, uh, there's always upsides and downsides to everything. And I learned, again, a lot of lessons, not not to give quite so much of myself. I mean, I do now because I'm old enough and ugly enough to deal with it. Um, but at the time, I became a little bit more circumspect. And uh, then going into my next project, that was the thing then that sort of took me out of that. And, and, uh, and you know, I walked back into the world of sailing. And literally, every, literally everyone was going... Where have you been for the past two years? Oh, on a farm in Wales. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> so then it was back into it. Uh. We're going to leave Tracy there for part one. As she just said, we'll be back into it in the next episode of The Pod, when we will have a chat with Tracy about the Maiden movie. As I said at the start of this pod, we talked to the director of the film about how it all came to be. And we talk the rest of Tracy's career, including a chat about how she resurrected Maiden after she was found rotting away in the Seychelles and brought her back to a very new and inspiring life. As ever, please do let me know what you think about the podcast. I'm sure you all know I'm at Shirley Sale on Instagram and Twitter, just me on Facebook. And please do remember to like, review and subscribe on whatever platform you're joining us on. It'd be great to know your thoughts on Tracy's tales or any of the other stories from the sailing world we have for you online. As ever, you've been listening to the tireless work of Tim at Vertigo Films, who produces the podcast for your listening pleasure. Many thanks, Tim. You're a star. Until next time, thank you so much for listening and sail safe, everyone. This is Castle One standing by. Out. Oh.